Next up, we have Angela Lopez, the development coordinator for Boys Hope, Girls Hope, for our speaker introduction. Thank you, everybody. I won't talk for long. Everybody uh, knows a lot about Kirsten Cinema because we have been hearing things in the news or we have been listening to your speeches and, uh, and there's also, we were sent um, an introduction for her as well. I assume everybody's seen that. However, I did pull something off her website that I thought was really interesting. Um, so this is actually a quote from the co-chair of the Republicans for Cinema. And so they, this person, Max uh, Foes, I think his name, or Fosse maybe, um, Kirsten is unlike anyone in elected office I know. Her character is beyond reproach, and her focus is unmatched. Her record proves it. In Congress and in the state legislature, she's found ways to bring people together and move past partisan divides to pass common, legis uh, common sense legislation that's good for Arizona. From scoring countless wins for our veterans to cutting red tape and allowing businesses to grow and hire, she knows how to get things done, and she'll work with anyone and everyone to do it. So, without further ado, Kirsten Cinema. Angela, thank you so much for that introduction. I really appreciate it. Um, Although when you started speaking, you said, we know a lot about Kirsten Cinema. we've seen it on TV. I wanted to say, yeah, half of that stuff's not true. <laughs> yeah. But you know, politics. Um, so thank you so much for that kind introduction. And thank you to Phoenix Rotary 100 for having me here this afternoon. It is such a pleasure to be here with community leaders who are committed to service and expanding opportunity right here in our valley. What I'd like to do first, if it's okay with you, is just tell you a little bit about my story and why I'm running for the United States Senate. As some of you know, I'm a little bit different than most people in politics. I was born in Tucson, Arizona, and my family went through some tough times when I was a kid. For a while, we were homeless. But thanks to family, church, and a lot of hard work, we got by. And my childhood taught me the power of working hard and the importance of helping others. I was lucky because I got my shot at the American dream, and now I'm running for the Senate to make sure that every Arizonan gets his or her shot too. My experience taught me a lesson that Rotarians know well. The best way to get things done for our communities is to bring people together and find areas where we can agree. I've spent my entire career, from my early days as a social worker in the Sunny Slope community, to the state legislature and now to the United States Congress, putting this lesson into practice and getting things done for Arizona. It isn't always easy, and you guys know this, actually everyone in Arizona knows this, Washington is a mess. But despite the dysfunction, I'm proud to say we've been able to get a lot done. Earlier this year, I worked with Senator John McCain to successfully protect three and a half billion dollars of funding for Arizona's public schools. That was really personal for me because public education was my ticket out of poverty and back to the middle class. So I consider it my job to make sure that all Arizonans can get access to a high quality public education. And the vast majority of the funding that Senator McCain and I protected will go straight into making sure that more teachers are in our classrooms and that they're earning higher salaries. We made this progress for Arizona students because he and I were always able to put politics aside and just get results for Arizona. And like most Arizonans, I don't care much for party labels. And I certainly don't let those party labels get in the way of doing what's right for our state. Here in Arizona, small businesses are the backbone of our economy. They make up over 97% of our economic engine. And that's one of the reasons I stood up to the party leaders in my party this year to help pass a major bill that increases access to capital for small businesses. And just last month, I was one of only three Democrats in the United States Congress that crossed the aisle to pass tax breaks um, for small businesses and for middle class families and to protect those businesses and families from a steep tax hike that could come. So these are changes that help Arizona businesses grow and create jobs. They're real results that Arizonans need. And it's just some of the work that I've done in Congress, but I think there's a lot more work that we must do if we want all Arizonans to get their shot at the American dream. There's so much at stake at this election. Uh, as I travel across the state, there's one thing that I hear about everywhere I go, 
from business leaders to veterans to seniors to young families, and it's health care. And that's why I'm fighting so hard to make health care more affordable and better quality for Arizona families and to protect people who are living with pre-existing conditions. You know, a couple months ago, I, I met a woman um, named Leslie from Scottsdale. She was diagnosed with juvenile diabetes when she was in high school. And she's taken five insulin shots a day, every day since high school. And she, of course, worries that her coverage could get out of control expensive if protections for people with pre-existing conditions goes away. And this is an area where there's a difference between me and my opponent. I understand she wasn't able to make it to meet with all of you last week. Um, so I'll, I'll just tell you what she thinks. I can do it for her. <laughs> um, but just a few weeks ago, this is an area of difference between Martha and I, because Martha um, thinks it's okay to take away those protections for people with pre-existing conditions. And just last month when we were in Congress, um, she said again that she would work to um, repeal that portion of existing law and um, and then folks wouldn't have those protections. So we've seen lately that, you know, our campaigns are spending a lot of time talking about the issue of pre-existing conditions in health care, and she's tried to kind of change her position on this. But my opinion is that your record is your record, and the votes you've taken are the votes you've taken. And I think these protections are just too important for Arizonans like Leslie and for our kids and for our parents and, frankly, for everyone in between. So I believe it's our duty to stand up for them. It's also why I'm working to make sure that older Arizonans aren't forced to pay up to five times as much for their health care because of AARP's age tax. So AARP said, look, if this part of the law gets repealed, people ages 50 to 64 will have to pay five times as much for their health care. That's just not fair. So I'm working to make sure I'm protecting that um, provision in law. And finally, working hard to protect Social Security and Medicare. So the issues are pretty straightforward, health care, education, creating good paying jobs for folks in Arizona. These are the issues that I hear about most while I'm out on the campaign trail and while I'm doing my job in the United States Congress, and they're the issues that I'm fighting for. You've seen a lot in the campaign recently, a lot um, in the campaign recently, um, and, and one of the things that I reflect on is that it feels to me like my opponent wants to make this campaign about me. But what I've done is worked really hard to make sure that this campaign's about Arizonans. Because I want to stay laser focused on the issues that matter most to everyday people. And as a senator, that's the work I'll do as well. Because I believe Arizonans deserve a senator who will stand up for them and be their voice in Washington, regardless of political party. And that's what I believe this campaign is about. It's about making sure that all Arizonans have an advocate in the United States Senate, regardless of party affiliation or ideology. And um, I look forward to continuing to do the work that we've been doing over the last six years in the United States Congress to make sure that all Arizonans have a shot at the American dream. So with that, um, I will stop and take some questions. Thank you, Congresswoman. Absolutely. Appreciate Thanks. it. Thanks. So um, to, to the members, um, Representative Sinema has a very tight schedule. Um, we do have a lot going on. <laughs> yeah, so. So um, she came skidding into the porticache. I mean, there, um, <laughs> I and, am a runner. Yeah. So. <laughs> and so, at any rate, um, she's going to have to to uh, uh, burn rubber out of here at 1:20. So, if you want to ask a question, please um, line up behind me so we can um, make sure that everybody who wants to ask a question gets to do it. I'll kick it off just real quick. You yeah. said the campaign's not about you, but a question for you: What's your impression of running for Senate so far? <laughs> Well, as you may have noticed, I'm currently in the nastiest Senate campaign in the country. Um, and what, to be honest with you, has been very disappointing is the tone of the campaign. I believe that Arizonans deserve to hear candidates who are debating on the issues and the real policy differences between us. But unfortunately, the campaign has um, become highly personal and very, uh, in my opinion, um, of the lowest sort. Uh, I am what the Arizona Republic calls a cheerful warrior, which means that I will not engage in that type of behavior. And the reason I don't is twofold. One, I would like to wake up in the morning and feel good about who I am and the work that I'm doing in my community. And number two, I believe that it lowers us as Americans to engage in very nasty personal campaigning. I think it is bad for our country, and I think it is bad for our democracy. So. As you've seen in my campaign, I'm taking a lot of hits. 
Um, but I continue to stay focused only on the issues and the differences between us. Um, it is my hope that by leading by this example that we can turn the tide and return electoral politics to be focused on substantive issues and the differences that we may have as Americans, but based on respect and uh, human dignity. All right. My question is, I've been in Arizona for over 40 years. Um, small business owner. The biggest issue, I think, is education. Yes. And I've talked to various people, and they always say, well, it's not a matter of money, although it's always money. It's intent. How do we fix? We only have this much money. That's How right. do we fix that? Because, yeah. you know, as a businessman, if I have that much money, i got to solve the problem. I appreciate that question because, again, you know, as you can tell in my own life, education was the ticket for me out of poverty and to, to the American dream. Um, and I take education very seriously. I go back and get a degree all the time because um, I want to learn more. But I think one of the fundamental things we need to adjust in our country is how we're teaching. So what I would like to see us do is start teaching children important skills that will help them be competitive in the global economy we face tomorrow. So teaching critical thinking skills and entrepreneurship and teaching students how to navigate change so that they're able to manage a rapidly changing global competitive marketplace. I think one of the challenges we face nationally is that we're falling behind against other countries because our education system hasn't caught up to the demands of tomorrow. So investing more in STEM is very important, but even more important than teaching that kind of data and information are teaching what I would call soft skills so that young people um, have the knowledge and the ability and the skill set to navigate a rapidly changing world. Uh, we no longer live in a climate where you're going to work at a company for 35 years and retire with a watch. Like, we just don't live in that world anymore. What we do live in is a world that is rapidly changing where those who have entrepreneurial skills and who understand how to navigate a changing community, those are the folks that thrive. And here in Arizona, again, 97% of our economy is uh, fueled by small businesses, which means we need to be teaching students the skills they need to be successful as entrepreneurs. So that's the kind of work that the federal government can do. State, you know, funding for education is largely controlled at the state level, but the federal government can provide um, guidance and incentives for states to change direction so that it's more relevant to the workplace and less about just filling in bubbles on a test. You had mentioned earlier in your remarks that you had recently crossed over with two or three other Democrats to vote in favor of a piece of legislation helping uh, provide tax breaks to small businesses. Yes. I have a two-part question, because that's great political ob optics, obviously. Did your, did those three cross, two parts, first part is did those three votes make the difference, resulting in the passage of legislation that would have failed without those three crossover votes? And second, can you name a, another piece of legislation where your crossover vote, perhaps along with other Democrats, where your crossover vote actually did change the outcome of a bill, either defeat, helped Repub the Republicans defeat a bill that was a bad bill, or helped them pass a bill that was a good bill, and that, and that would not have had that same outcome but for your crossover. In response to your first question about the three Democrats who voted yes on the legislation last month, um, the vote was close, but I, I can't tell you offhand that my vote was the deciding vote. I don't have that data in front of me, but I could certainly get it to you. Um, the reality of me being one of just one, two, or three Democrats voting for a piece of legislation is not only un not unusual, it's actually common practice. So um, my voting record is about 62% with President Trump's priorities, which is the second highest of any Democrat in the United States Congress. Um, and some people like that, some people don't like it. The reason I talk about it is because I think that it is a testament to my commitment to voting for pieces of legislation when I think it's the right idea. I don't care whose party it is. I don't care if it's a Democrat idea or Republican idea. If it's a good idea, I'm going to vote for it. And so there is a long list of legislation where my vote has actually helped pass legislation that would have failed otherwise. I'd be more than happy to get you specifics on that legislation. There actually are several 
There have been several votes where I was the only Democrat in the country to vote yes on a piece of legislation. Most recently, it was on a rule which would allow a bill to move forward to be debated on in a budget context. I was the only Democrat to vote yes on that, and my vote did make a difference, and it allowed us to move forward with the budget legislation. Other examples that I can offer you in the past would be the Farm Bill. The Farm Bill is a bill that comes up every five years or so in Congress. And it used to be very bipartisan, but in recent years has become a partisan tool where both parties have used it to bludgeon each other, which is unfair because in a state like Arizona, we are so dependent on a healthy agricultural um, climate that we need the passage of the Farm Bill. and. Uh, I have stepped across the aisle and voted for a farm bill, even with, I think there was one other Democrat from Minnesota who was with me, who's a farmer, <laughs> and, um, and we were able to pass a bill that would have failed otherwise. So I can get you a list of those, but it's a quite long list. Uh, first, I'd like to ask you that uh, uh, your support for the military. I don't know if, if, if you're aware, I'm sure you are, there are four very large military bases here. In Arizona. I've visited every single one of them. Okay, plus, plus the fact we have a lot of defense contractors here. 40% okay. of Arizona's economic engine comes from military contracting. Okay. It's how, the fifth largest military contracting okay. state in the country. Okay, how, how, does that, how is that gonna work with your earlier days when you were very much of a pacifist? I actually come from military family. So my big brother is a Marine. He's retired from the force and now is a uh, the K-9 sergeant for the Tucson Police Department, and I couldn't be more proud of him, as you can tell. My little brother still serves in active duty today. He's currently deployed on his seventh deployment. His seventh deployment. He's in the Navy, he's a gunner's mate, and um, I think about him every day. He's now deployed seven times in this war, and I worry about him. So the question um, about my support for the military has become an issue in this campaign. But frankly, it is not true. I have long supported our military, coming from a military family myself. My stepdad served in Vietnam, and my grandpa earned a Purple Heart in World War II. And this matters very much to me. So my record on both standing with our military and standing for our veterans is unimpeachable. Now, some folks who would prefer that I not win this election have chosen to distort my history um, and they can choose to do so because we have a First Amendment in this country. But my record is very clear, and I would encourage anyone who's interested to actually take a look at my voting record as well as the legislation that I have sponsored and passed to help support our military and veterans in this state. Thanks. There is talk that if the uh, Democrats are able to take over uh, your current um, House, that there will be an impeachment effort uh, against the president. Um, since you say you're the second highest percentage of, of uh, voting with the president, I assume that you'd be against that. Absolutely, it's a horrible what, idea. What would you do to convince your party yeah. not, not to go ahead with that? I think that moving forward on impeachment is a horrible idea. What I think would be much smarter is to actually work to solve the problems that our country's facing. Because when I travel the state and listen to Arizonans, no one says to me, oh, I wish you would do this or I wish you would do that. You know, they say to me, I'm worried about health care, I'm worried about education, I'm worried about having a good job so I can take care of my kids. And as you've noticed in my campaign, that's what I'm focusing on because that's what folks tell me they care about. And I have said from the very, very beginning when people started talking about these ideas of wanting to impeach the president that I think that's a horrible idea. Not only do they not have the evidence to do it, but it's just a bad idea. It's not productive and it doesn't move our country forward. In terms of convincing others, um, as I mentioned earlier, I've tried to live my um, political career in particular by being an example to others. So while there are those who engage in nasty name calling towards each other of different political parties, and while there are those who um, focus on attacking each other, and while there are those who engage in what I would consider to be extreme activity on both edges of the political spectrum, I try hard to be an example. An example of someone who is thoughtful, who is moderate, and who makes decisions right down the middle of the line. Because that's where most Arizonans and most Americans live, is right down the middle of the line. So I would continue to do what I've done over the last six years, which is seek to communicate with people on both sides of the aisle 
to let them know what I believe the values of my community are and to be an example of engaging in that kind of higher level um, activity. You know, just a quick note on this that we have seen that politics has gotten more vitriolic than at any time in our lifetime. And unfortunately, dangerous things are happening in our community. Um, and often when that happens, people will say, well, we should all tone down our rhetoric and we should stop saying irresponsible, horrible things to each other. I don't have to say that because I don't do that. I just, I don't. I don't say those kinds of things about other people in my own party or another party. Mm -hmm. And it's because I believe it is not only irresponsible, it provides a horrible example to the rest of the community. And um, so uh, back to the question of what will I do um, as a United States Senator, not only will I forcefully speak against bad ideas that further divide our country, I will encourage others to join me in that place in the middle where it's cool to compromise and where you just focus on solving problems. Because that's what I believe that Americans want. They want someone to make their life better, not worse. Um, and that's where I'll spend my time and energy. In, your, uh, in the one uh, debate that you had with um, Martha McSally, she accused you a number of times of lying. There's a lot of um, campaign promises and mm -hmm. uh, speech on what each of you has done. Uh, when you mentioned, um, or when Martha McSally has mentioned that she is fighting for Medicare and Medicaid and Social Security, and she has stated that she's fighting for the uh, requirement that insurance companies um, um, continue, or that they be required to uh, cover uh, uh, preconditions, um, I wonder if you could uh, kind of clarify what her position may actually be, uh, some of which is based on my understanding that Mitch McConnell is going around and telling everybody that as soon as the midterms are over, they're going to um, cut Social Security and they're going to cut Medicare in order mm -hmm. to cover the deficit from mm -hmm. the taxes. I would encourage you to go look at the votes because the vote record speaks for itself. We take votes on issues in the United States Congress. They are public votes. They are recorded. You cannot change that. So if you go take a look at the votes, that is where the difference is. And, you know, people can call names all they want. But if you look at the vote record, the vote record tells you how someone voted on an issue. And when there have been votes taken on whether or not to cut Medicare, we have voted differently when there have been votes taken on whether or not to turn Medicare into a voucher program, we have voted differently. When there have been votes taken on whether or not to protect people with pre-existing conditions or remove those protections, we have voted differently. So I, she can speak to her own belief about her opinions. That is, I, I would never pretend to do that for someone else. But I would encourage you to look at the votes. Thank you very much. Thanks. We appreciate you being here. Thank you so much. Well, thank you for being here today. It's my and, pleasure. And for answering everyone's questions. That's very much appreciated. And in recognition and in appreciation of your participation today, we have a certificate. And along with this certificate, we've made a donation in your name to the Salvation Army's Adult Rehabilitation Center which operates a six-month, totally free drug and alcohol uh, addiction program. I have visited it. Oh, great. Yeah, that well, is wonderful. Thank you so much. Thank you so much. It was great much. meeting you. You too. All right. I appreciate it. Thank, thank you. you. Oh. Oh. Thank you.